I've been getting all kinds of emails and questions about pork chops and how to cook them so they're not dry. I've also been getting questions because people see on my website that I use sous vide and they don't really know what sous vide is. So today we're going to do some pork chops in the sous vide. Let me first tell you, sous vide is just a way of heating water. It's a water bath. It takes it to an exact temperature. So we want to cook these probably to about 140, 135 to 140, depending on how you like your meat cooked. But you actually set it to the temperature that you desire the meat to be at. These will cook for two hours. I could cook them for six hours. I could cook them for eight hours. It's not going to change. They're not going to overcook. They're not going to dry out because they're going to only cook to 140 degrees. So you're going to have that perfect temperature, the perfect consistency. And actually, the longer you let it cook, the more tender the meat becomes because it breaks down just a little bit more, breaks down the fats and everything in the meat. So I like to cook mine for at least two hours. Sometimes if I have time, I'll do them for four hours. Today I'll probably do them for about four hours. And then after I take them out, we're gonna do what's called a reverse sear. I'm gonna actually use my cast iron skillet, heat it up scorching hot because these are already cooked. I don't wanna put them into a skillet and start cooking them at a lower heat and building it up because it'll just continue to cook the pork chops. I want it flash fried just like that. Well, not really fried, but basically just cooked on the outside, give it some texture, give it some flavor because everyone knows that there's a lot of flavor in the browning of the meat. So what I'll do is I'll take them out, I'll let them sit for about 10, 15 minutes so they come down a little bit in temperature, maybe about 135, 130 to 135. And then when I put them in the pan and it's only gonna cook them for maybe two minutes on each side, basting them with butter, I'll put some rosemary in there for more flavor. It's not gonna get the temperature above 140 so you're not gonna overcook the meat. So the first thing you do, and I always coat all of my the meat with oil first, of olive, some kind of olive oil or canola oil. That way everything, the seasonings I put on it, they're going to absorb into the meat during the cooking, will stick to it. I'm going to use today actually a garlic infused olive oil. I don't know if you can see that. Any of my infused olive oils, I always get from Joe and Sons in Tampa. I'm not getting paid for this. Marilyn is a personal friend of mine. I started using these back when I lived in Tampa and it's the only infused olive oils I'll use. If I'm using plain olive oil, I'll just use an olive oil, but if I want something infused with flavor, and I'll put this link down below in the comment section so you can see exactly where to get it. If you're interested, they have many flavors. So like I said, this is a garlic infused, so I'm just gonna coat the outside of the pork chop a little bit. Turn it over because we wanna do both sides. That way the salt, the pepper, and the garlic actually stick to it. I will be putting a little bit more garlic on there. There we go. Don't need a whole lot. And then we're gonna use, I use pink Himalayan salt. It doesn't give as much of a salty taste, less sodium, I believe. So it's just a little bit more flavorful, I believe, without adding all the salt. And since it's gonna be cooking for two to four hours, I like to use a crushed black pepper that gives it time to break down. It has better flavor than pepper that's been sitting in a container for the last six months to a year, losing all its flavor. This way, it's fresh cracked. All the oils are coming out of the pepper and you're getting those flavors right into the meat. Now you would think that this olive oil and these seasonings would be enough, but the olive oil is not enough. I always, always put a little stick of butter right on top of each piece. It's gonna cook in, add a little bit of garlic to the top. And then I'm gonna use um, oregano and rosemary today. I'm just gonna put two of these on each, rosemary one on each and two of the oregano. I'm gonna put butter there. And then a lot of people can't decide if they, what kind of bag they use. I have, since the day I started this, I've been doing this probably well, I started seven years ago using this exact um, immersion circulator. I just use a Ziploc bag, a freezer Ziploc bag. You can get the ones that you seal them and air, okay. but I've never ever had a problem with these. So the main thing you want to do is put them as far down in the bottom of this bag as you can. Let me turn it over so you get a better view of it. I'm not right, it's not on top. I'm going to put that in there. Put the other one right beside it, as far down in the bottom of the bag as you can. Get rid of 
this plate. Now, once you got them in the Ziploc bag, you gotta get all the air out of them. A lot of people have difficulty getting that out. I'm gonna show you one of the tricks that I've learned. Seal it almost all the way over. Push out what you can. And then lower it into the water bath. And as you lower it down into the water bath, that's automatically gonna push all the air out. As you can see, I pushed it all the way closed. Open this up. The water's pushing it all out. There we go. We have it out, we have it sealed, and everything's nice and compact. So then you wanna make sure that the meat always stays below the water line, whatever you're cooking. So what I like to do, take a couple of these little clips, I'll put one over here, and I'll put one over here. It's below the water level. Let me give you a close-up view of this so you can see what we're dealing with. It's down below the water level. We've got it set at 140. It's about 139.2 now. It went down a little bit because we just put this in. And we're just going to let this cook and go for, like I said, probably four hours today. Usually it's two hours, but I've got plenty of time. So we'll let this cook for four hours at 140. When we come back, we're going to take them out, let them sit for about 10 minutes. Then we're going to do a reverse sear and cast iron skillet. I'll show you how beautiful they look. Talk to you soon. Okay, so I thought I'd show you how to use my air fryer to make roasted potatoes. I have a lot of people ask me not only about the sous vide that I'm doing the pork chops in that are in another video to see, but also I'm doing vegetables. Um, potatoes I usually do for about 20 minutes in the air fryer. I do it at about 400 degrees. I'm going to keep checking them, especially since I'm going to be putting in garlic into here as well as the onions because as you know, garlic's gonna burn easily. So we gotta keep an eye on that. So I've got probably about a pound of white potatoes, rest, white rest of potatoes, baby potatoes, and half of a, a sweet onion. I'm gonna use three cloves of garlic. I'm just gonna smash it and then give it a rough chop and put that in there as well. If you haven't noticed from all my cooking, I do like garlic, I like spicy. I'm not afraid to choose it just about everything. So let's go ahead and put this garlic in. And just to give it a little bit extra help, I'm going to use the same olive oil, roast the uh, garlic infused olive oil from that I get from Joe and Sons up in Tampa that I used in the pork chops. I'm just going to put a little bit of this on here. This is just to keep everything, you know, sticking to it and let it brown up a little bit more. So I'm also gonna put in some of my chicken seasoning. This is what I use when I roast chickens or I use chickens in the smoker. Actually, even when I do them in the air fryer. I just like the flavor of it. I think it lends itself to the potatoes. So I'm probably about a teaspoon, two ta teaspoons full in there. Let me mix that up a little bit. And you can see that oil not only spreads the vinegar flavor throughout, it also gives a place to help the seasoning actually stick to it. All right. So now once I get all of this mixed together, nice and good, we'll actually, yeah, we'll put it on about 400. And I'm gonna start it at 10 minutes because at 10 minutes, I'm gonna go in and check that and make sure it's not burning. I'm gonna shake it around a little bit, move it around didn't do it for another 10 minutes. So let me get these in the air fryer. You really don't need to preheat the air fryer. It heats up really fast. There we go. So we're gonna go for about 10 minutes and then we'll check the potatoes. So the potatoes are done. They've been cooking for 20 minutes. As you can see, we have nice, crispy, brown potatoes. I like to finish them off. Put all the onions, get the garlic out of the bottom there. Finish them off with just a little bit more olive oil. A little bit of salt. Toss them around. And these are going to go awesome tonight with the pork chops that we're soon eating.
Okay, we're back. The pork chops have been in the sous vide since the 11.30, so they've actually been on for about five hours they've been in this, cooking at 140 degrees. We're all done. Like I said, they're not gonna be overcooked because they never went over that temperature. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take them out. Carefully, they are submerged, they've stayed submerged. You can see the butter and some juices that came out of the pork chops that are in there. We're gonna save that because I'm gonna put them in the pan when I'm cooking them. This water, I'm not gonna throw out. I'm just gonna let it cool down and then I'll use it to water plants so we're not wasting all this water. There's probably been two gallons or more in there. Always take your sous vide out, get all the water out of it. And I usually let mine lay on a towel overnight to dry out because I don't wanna put it away wet, get any parts in there messed up or rusting. So put it over on the towel and just leave it sit overnight. Away. Okay, so as you can see, everything's cooked in there. Of course, the meat still looks white because it hasn't been seared, any fire, heat, or anything given to it. So we're going to take it out, tongues out, remove each one of them, and we're going to let that dry. So we don't put, we don't want to put it in the hot pan wet because it's just going to splash, it's going to steam, and we're not going to crisp up the outside like we need to. So I'm going to get a small dish to put that in. I'll pour that in at the end. You don't have to, a lot of people throw it out, but it's just extra flavor, I think, from the meat and from the spices and from the herbs that we put up. So we're going to save that, get ready here. We're going to put the butter over here because we're going to use butter. Place them off. You get off the herbs that are used up now. So we're gonna. I got some fresh ones out of the garden that we're gonna put into the butter. So, like I said earlier, you just want it to cool down a little bit. You want them to get below 140. So when we start doing the reverse sear, they don't continue to cook anymore. We just want the outside seared. We're outside some brown on it. There you go, I dry everything off. I got this pan, you can probably see a little bit of smoke already coming up from it. I'm gonna add some olive oil to it. Okay, we have smoke coming off the cast iron, so I'm gonna go ahead and lay these in. Like I said, this part's gonna be quick because we don't want them to cook any more than they already are. Goes in. I'm going to put a couple of pats of butter. Get that started milling. Since I already put the olive oil in, the butter is not going to burn like it would if I just put straight butter. So now I've got some more oregano and rosemary. We're going to put those in. Just going to let this sear for a second. Once I turn it the first time, I'll do that, I'll show you. And I'm going to start spooning the butter over the top of it. Actually, I think I need a little bit more butter. So make sure they have good contact with the bottom of the stove. A minimal time here just to get some flavor and brown on them. I've got it on about medium high. My stove is a number eight. A little bit more. I probably could have used a bigger skillet. Get the herbs down in the butter, get some flavor off the onion, rendering into it. I'm going to turn over and do the second side. Okay, now I'm going to bring the unshot and set it on and just baste it with the extra butter. Okay. 
This one is spoon the butter over top of the pork chops to get some more flavor into them. Actually helps me keep cooking now. Like I said, they're fully done. All we're doing is putting some caramelization on the outside and we'll add some flavor. Alright, let's check the bottom. We are done on both sides. I'm going to cut this off, put it back on the plate, right over top of them. Let that cook down. I'm going to get the pork chops out. I'm just going to make like a little pan sauce out of that. So we have the pork chops out, let them rest. Never have too much butter. Let's just mount it with a little bit of butter. A little bit of salt and pepper. Flavor out of the rosemary and pine nut. Actually, I keep saying pine, but it's oregano. Okay. I'm just going to spoon some of this over top of it. You got the butter, you got the juices that they cooked in, sous vide all day. There you go. Okay, here's our pork chops that we did in the sous vide and didn't reverse seared in the cast iron skillet. Let me cut it open and slice a piece and show you how juicy it really is cooking all day. As you can see, juice is still flowing. It's not well done. It's nice and tender, just a little bit pink. Perfectly juicy, not dry. This is the kind of pork chop you're going to like. So I hope you try this recipe, and I'll see you back again in my kitchen soon. Have a great day.